thank you for coming out this morning. I, I've just had a time a moment of shock. I, Ed had walked over to me just briefly before he got up here and asked me the, uh, the passage, and I just just almost in, immediately thought I told him Matthew 17. <laughs> uh, but uh, he he was right on with it. Of course, he's an excellent reader. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, how to think, believe, and live in the kingdom of God. Really, that, that's a, a, a subject, a, a topic. It's kind of broad. It covers the whole of, uh, of the Sermon on the Mount, when I'm really going to be uh, kind of narrowing it down to the passages that uh, Brother Bloomley has just read. We're going to look at how we are to conduct ourselves in light of what God has revealed in the Scriptures. And what is our attitude toward the Word of God? How much do we respect God by honoring His Word? Do we really believe it? Are we dedicated to it? You know, this sermon, that we call this the Sermon on the Mount, it may be the most famous of of all of Jesus' teaching. I'm not saying it's the best. All of His teaching was the best. But but uh, probably the most famous of all. And He taught this on the morning right after he had chosen the 12. Can you imagine that? Being just within the very first day to stand or sit and listen to such wonderful, wondrous, awesome teaching of Jesus. There were other disciples present and there were curiosity seekers present. So he was preaching as he stood on this mount. He was preaching to... to, uh, probably a lot of people, but I think primarily, I've come to believe that primarily he's talking, he's teaching the 12 in preparation for what they are going to have to do. How do you conduct yourself in light of the scriptures? How are you to live your lives in God's kingdom? How much respect do you must, must you have for God and His Word in order to be pleasing to the God of heaven? This sermon starts at Matthew 5 and, and verse 17, and uh, it, uh, there's introductory remar- remarks, and, and he talks the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 and verse 17. It's kind of a, a continuous theme, flows all the way down to chapter 7 through 12. Uh, Ed, Ed has just read the, the passage. I'm going, going to bring it up on the screen, but not going to read it again. You know, when you want to understand what God is saying, how, how can I know what He wants? I read this, and it's, it, it's a little confusing to me. Right? I'm not just sure what He wants. One of the best things you can do to understand Scripture is to, to look and to see what has been repeated. Look and see what is important enough that God has by the power of, of and through, by means of the Holy Spirit, what has been repeated. Repeating words or, or phrases or really even just thoughts or ideas. And when you look at this paragraph, when you look at what's said here, there is something that, that stands out. In, in verse 17, again, it's on the screen In verse 17, it mentions the law and the prophets. You know what the the Lord and and really all the Jews in his day were referring to when they said the law and the prophets? The law was the first five books of the Old Testament. We refer to that as the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the prophets is the rest of the Old Testament scriptures. So the scriptures, God's word. Jesus is talking about what you and I call the Old Testament. But at that time, they would simply have referred to it as the scriptures. What is in the scriptures? Early, it was the only scripture they had. You and I have a, a New Testament. We, we have additional scriptures, but they had the law of Moses, the Old Testament scriptures. I think Jesus is concerned. And I think that's the reason, the primary reason 
for the sermon. He's concerned that the disciples might get the wrong idea about the law of Moses, about the law. And he wants to clarify some things to them. And he wants to emphasize some things. to them. He wants them to know that the Old Testament law, the law of Moses, the only scriptures they had at that time, he wants them to understand that they came from God and that he himself respected them highly. He was involved in their revelation. We're going to look, in a different sermon, we're going to look at at Jesus' idea of the scriptures in more detail. But for the, at this time, we're going to, to examine what he was telling the disciples. What should a disciple like you, like me, what should our attitude be toward the scriptures? And should the scriptures affect us? Should, should our lives be changed Should we be guided and directed? He wants them to understand clearly how important the scriptures are. Why would he start there? Well, because the disciples might, as the Jews were soon to accuse them of, think the scriptures were not as important since they had a new lawgiver. They had Christ in place of Moses. And he doesn't want them to, re- to, to think that. He doesn't want them to, for one moment to think that the Old Testament scriptures are any less the word of God than is the New Testament, the New Covenant. He wants them, he wants them to have respect and honor for that word. The, the attitude maybe may have existed in the disciples I'll tell you for sure it has existed since then, is that now that we have a New Testament, we no longer need an Old Testament. I have been, I have been uh, in churches through the years where there were, were some of the men in those churches that not only thought but expressed their thoughts about using the Old Testament. They flat thought it was sin to use the Old Testament. They had a New Testament Bible in their hand, and they thought it was just, it was just flat wrong. That old law has been nailed to the cross. We, we follow Christ. We don't follow Moses. And there, it, it, it's like error so many times. The error that is most likely to, to deceive is error that is, has a grain of truth in it. Sometimes a lot of grains of truth. They thought it was wrong. Jesus doesn't want the disciples for one moment to think that it is not important to follow the Old Testament scriptures. And the other tendency that exists, it existed then and it exists today, they had a big problem with the scribes and Pharisees who were they were more concerned about the letter of the law than the heart of the law. It was more about what you do than what you believe or or whether or not your heart is in it. Instead of worshiping in spirit and in truth, they just emphasized the word of God and the problem was, we'll talk about that in a, this in a moment, was they eventually got to the point they couldn't tell the word of God from the word of man. Their traditions to them were just as important. And therefore they had a big problem. They were legalistic. They were not forgiving. They had no heart in what they were doing. And I don't mean every one of them. You know that's not true. But as a whole, that was the problem. They did not use the scriptures as God meant for them to be used. And the scriptures did not have the effect on them that God meant for, for the scriptures uh, uh, to have. Here's the summary, at, really, of, of this passage. To be faithful subject of Jesus Christ as we are citizens in his kingdom. So we're following the king, Jesus. 
when we have the right regard for the Word of God. A person must have a right relationship to the Scripture. You, you can't have God and disregard His Word. That, that, that just doesn't work. You can't say, I, I love the Lord and I'm saved by the Lord, but I have no respect for His Word. Or I just don't follow that Bible. I don't listen to that much. Or maybe you say, I listen to it, but the, you don't ever study it. You don't ever think for yourself. All you ever get is what you hear in, in a Bible class or, or from the pulpit. We are to be a people that love the Lord and we love Him enough to want to know His Word. We listen to Him. Isn't that true in life? Don't you listen to people that you love? And as a whole, maybe not all the time, depending on how you feel at the moment or what's on your mind, but but when you're listening to someone you love, you You just cherish those words. You care about what they think. You care about what they say. Such is true with the Word of God. We we must understand the relationship that God, through Jesus Christ, would have us hold to in our hearts, be in our minds, in our thoughts, and in our actions. So when you're thinking about the three responses to the Scriptures, as people look at the Scriptures, the three three responses, number one, uh, went, went a little too far already. Number one, you must understand Jesus' relationship to the Old Testament. Let me explain what I'm saying. The Old Testament was all about Jesus. From the time in the Garden of Eden when when God gave Adam and Eve a a glimpse of hope because of the, the fallen position they were in, condition, after being separated from him, after sinning. The seed of the woman would come. That's Jesus, see? The Savior would come. So from from that time on, the Old Testament is about Jesus. It's preparing preparing the, the hearts and minds of the people for a Messiah. And they talked a lot about the Messiah, but they misunderstood the the nature of the rule of the Messiah. Therefore, they just looked for an earthly conqueror instead of a savior of all mankind. You must believe that Jesus had a profound respect for the word of God. And we see that in uh, we see that in verse 18. I don't know if I can get back. In verse 18 that he had a great respect for the word of God. I say to you, he says, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whether it's the, the dot above the eye or, 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 or the cross that, that makes a T, the smallest of God's law, of God's Bible, of God's word is important. And Jesus said, not even one jot or one tittle can be disregarded. You have to have respect for it. You must follow it. And without it, you have nothing. And number two, you must believe that Jesus, as I said in in his view of the scriptures, is so important. And then then number three, you must accept Jesus, uh, what he has to say, his diagnosis. What do we do about having a lack of concern. How how do we, how are we healed? We don't always like what God tells us, what he says, what he reveals. But we must have enough respect for God that it is his way and his will that we follow. I think in verse 19 and 20, as you see on the screen, Jesus says you can identify yourself. You can identify whether you're least in the kingdom of heaven, whether you're great in the kingdom of heaven, or maybe even whether you're not even in the kingdom at all. 
by looking at the Word of God. I want us to consider that the first response, the first of the things I just mentioned, what is the attitude that I should have to Scripture? What is my attitude? Well, first of all, look at this. In verse 17 there, Jesus says, do not think. He gave a negative. We have to be careful about what we think about the Word of God. We can think it's, just, it's a great book. Or it, 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 it tells some wonderful stories. We may even think, well, I think it's wonderful. I can see God touched it, but it's not completely His. Or we can have the attitude that it is a great book, but I've already figured most of it out, and, and therefore, it's not all worth all that much to me anymore. Or we can realize that God's word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. That it's God's, it's God's map toward heaven. It's God's map to Jesus Christ. It's God's map to himself. You know, in the first century, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, the, 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 in the first century, the law and the prophets was just shorthand. It, it was talking about scripture. They just say the scriptures. And when they said scriptures, that's what they meant. What we call the Old Testament. I, th- I think it's important uh, to, to know that. We call that, theologians call it the, the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. Really, they refer to it, uh, scholars refer to it as the Old Testament canon. But it's the Old Testament Do you realize that in the New Testament, that the New Testament writers, the authors of of the New Testament, do you realize that they, they understood what was the Word of God, the Old Testament scriptures, they understood it well, and they quoted it often. Uh, They said, it is written, or thus saith the law, 295 times. They were constantly referring to the Word of God. And a little bit of extra information, not necessarily pertinent to, to this sermon, but I thought it was, it's an interesting fact. You know, a lot of the Bibles, even very early on, in, in really, in, in the first few centuries, uh, some of the, the oldest Bibles had what we call the Apocrypha in them. But in all the quotes, in all that Jesus and all the apostles said, and they were constantly quoting it, the Old Testament, they never once quoted the Apocrypha. I realize, and I haven't realized for very many years, that they looked at the Apocrypha as kind of a commentary for the times. And maybe, not, that maybe they weren't quite as offended by it as we are because they, they knew it wasn't Scripture. It was just, in some cases, helpful. But they knew what was the Word of God. And it's the 39 books that we have what we call the Old Testament. So they weren't confused about that. They taught that. They believed that. And Jesus said you must respect it. You can't change one jot or one tittle. You can't leave any of it out. You've got to follow what he's telling them. Again, if you look at verse 17, We're the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, and God cares about what we think about his word. Don't think this, but think that. How did Jesus want us to see his relationship? What what does he want us to think about him and his relationship to the Old Testament? First of all, he says, I didn't come to abolish 
but to fulfill. There is a difference there. I didn't come to, to abolish it. I came to fulfill it. I came, I came for the very purpose it was written. Everything about it is about me. I didn't come to destroy it. I came that everything that has said in it would be fulfilled in me. I came to honor the Father by obeying it. It's God's will. And so he showed great respect for the word of God. Jesus was really saying to them, Jesus is saying, now I want you to listen to this. He said there's an idea that's, that's circulating, an idea that, that's getting around. It, it, a lot of people are hearing it and a lot of people are accepting it, but really he says it's false. And that's the relationship of the Messiah, his disciples, and the Old Testament scriptures. Brother, there isn't anything in the Gospels that, that where a, an accusation is made, we, where we can actually pull up a verse and say an accusation is made against Jesus and, and his attitude toward the Scripture. But later, I think it existed. I think we don't have it written down. Later, we know for sure that there were false charges made about the, the, the way disciples looked at the Scriptures. Remember in the book of Acts chapter 6, we have the sermon of Stephen. Do you, realize, or do you remember what the result of him preaching that sermon was? They picked up rocks and they hit him with those rocks till he was dead. And, and in that sermon, Acts 6 and verse 11, they secretly induced men to say, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses. Blasphemous words against the law of Moses. The Old Testament scriptures. The word of God. They said he's contradicting. What he says is not in harmony with what God has revealed. And it shows a lack of respect for the word of God. Look down in verse 13 of Acts chapter 6. They put forward false witness who said this man, that is Stephen, incessantly, never stops, and speaks against this holy place in the law. Why? For we have heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. He constantly speaks against the law of Moses and the temple. But where our focus this morning is on the law of Moses. The disciples were accused early on, very early on, of of not having a proper regard. They were teaching a resurrected Christ. They were teaching that, that Jesus came forth from the grave and that you've killed the Messiah. Destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days, Jesus said, and that was, ver that was a blasphemy to them. Their attitude about the Scripture in a way, I mean, they had strong feelings about it. But they misunderstood it. And their misunderstanding was so great, they eventually killed Christ. I'm going to tell you something, that's right. That's what happens, even in churches today. You have those who are so sure they're right. They bind things they're confident they're right. And yet they're just like the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees. They are wrong. And they're misusing the word of God and doing it to the destruction of God's people and the destruction of the church. 
Jesus did not follow their traditions. They didn't separate them, you see. They, they, didn't, they couldn't separate in their own minds the traditions from, from the Word of God. They, to them, truly in their hearts, they thought they were the same. Therefore, there was a big problem. So when Jesus wouldn't march to their drum, to their little drum, they thought they were big stuff. But Jesus didn't go along with them, and when he did, they took it, they took the fact that he wouldn't give in and accept their traditions as, as faith, as from God. When, they, when, when he didn't, then he became their enemy, and they hated him. They despised him. Eventually, they hung him on the cross. They, had, they thought their, their traditions were on the par, on par with the scriptures, the cell. You know, you see that in their, their view of the Sabbath. Jesus would heal on the Sabbath, and they said, whoa, what a violator. He doesn't respect God's law. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and he doesn't. But in the end, it was because of their understanding of Scripture and their, their misuse and abuse of what the Word of God actually said. That caused them to hate Jesus, to despise him. To them, when Jesus would heal on the Sabbath, they thought he was not taking the law of Moses seriously. They really did. They thought he doesn't care about the Word of God. Look at what he does. They couldn't see the greatness in him. They couldn't see the, the miracle that was just performed for what it was, an act of God. They couldn't see that. Why? Because he violated their traditions and they thought he was evil. If we can learn anything from that, we can be, each person here can make up his or her mind that I'm going to be care, very careful to say thing, something is right or wrong according to God's word, if all I'm going by is what I have heard and not what I have studied through. It's even possible that the disciples of the Lord themselves had a wrong understanding and they didn't come to a clear understanding till after the resurrection. Jesus was not trying to tear down the Old Testament at all. He came. He loved it. He's the lawgiver. He came to, to fulfill it. If every person in here could have the kind of love for God's law that Jesus had, well, the whole world would be different. Great, great love for the Word of God. Just think about the words of the Apostle Paul as he looked at the scriptures. Not just the New Testament, but more specifically, the Old. Here's what he said. He said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. You know, that literally means God breathed, the breath of God. Just as God breathed into the clay and he formed Adam, a living soul. God brings life into the church, in, into us, into me, into you. Through his word. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God's word. And it's full of him. You know, the, the Puritans here in the earlier settlers in our country used to say the new, the new testament, the new covenant that we call the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. And the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. You've heard that. I'm sure you've heard that expression. That's what really, as far as I can see, that's where it originated with the Puritans. You have what's in the New Testament. You have the New Testament revealing what was really meant, truly meant, what God meant in the Old Covenant. Why? Because it has the stamp of Jesus on it. And when Jesus was teaching the disciples what, what's right and, and, and what's wrong, 
I, I want to look in the, at an, just a, an example of where they misused the scriptures. Maybe most of them were sincere, but they were abusing the scriptures in Matthew 5 and verse 22, just a, a few verses down. They, they said, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. And can you see that the Jews, he's, he's standing or sitting there and, and he's talking to other Jews and, and he, he says to himself, okay, I haven't murdered anybody. You haven't murdered anybody. That's good. Okay, that, that's, we got that one taken care of. Let's move on. And yet Jesus said it meant a lot more than that. You see, they already, they already had it marked off. Well, I'm all right. You're all right. Makes each other feel good about it. But what Jesus is saying, it's not only, it's not only whether or not you actually pick up a stone or a, a, a club and you kill them, but what do you think about it? What are you saying? What are you calling them? You call them a fool? What do you call them? How, how, do, how is it that What's in your heart is exposed by the things you say, and you don't have a knife or a gun, but you're just using words. Jesus said that is sin. That's a violation of what God meant by this law. They thought it stopped at the point of actually taking a life. Jesus said, no, God wanted to get your heart. He, he, meant, he, he meant a whole lot more than that. Jesus never felt compelled. And I, I've, I've got many examples. I'm not going to give any more of uh, examples. Uh, even, even like uh, adultery. You know, you to, Jesus said it's not just a physical act, but to look on a woman to lust after her. He's committed adultery. He says, you think it's okay as long as you don't commit the act. It doesn't matter what's in your heart. It doesn't matter what's in your mind. You may have the most filthy mind in the world. And you don't care. He says it does matter. God didn't mean just to stop the physical act. He wants your hearts in spirit and in truth. Makes a difference. Jesus said this is what that actually meant. So when Jesus said those words in Matthew chapter 5, he's not teaching something new for the New Testament He's teaching them the proper application of the Old Testament. This is what God actually meant, he said. And you've perverted it. You've missed it. You think you're so righteous, and yet you're so far away. Jesus said, I want you to know, I love God's word. And I follow God's word. And I want you to follow God's word. Jesus did this very thing. He obeyed the Old Testament in his life. He obeyed. If you don't obey God's law, what are you? You're a sinner. Jesus died without sin. He sacrificed without sin. And he embodied the Old Testament in his person. As you looked at Jesus, you're looking at, at the law being fulfilled. You're looking at, it's almost like you're seeing the Old Testament, but it's in body form. Doing exactly what the law said should be done. And Jesus is saying, I want you to take my word into your heart, be a part of you. I want you to follow God and love God. You know, it's no wonder that the Apostle John called Jesus the living word. You remember that? In John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. 
John had a pretty good understanding of how much Jesus loved the Word of God. He was the Word, John said. He's the living Word of God. He fulfilled it. He took it upon himself and, and made it a part of, of, of his existence because even at the cross, he prayed. It, it, Jesus in the garden prayed, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Your will, your law, your word. I'm here to follow you, he said. As you and I sit or stand here this very day, we're here with hope because Jesus died for our sins, having loved God enough to love the Word of God. And he was teaching his disciples that they needed to have a great respect, honor, and love for the Word of God. And that's just as true today. We honor God by following God, honoring God. I haven't talked about how to become a Christian, but that's the end of, of what I have uh, uh, as a sermon. But I hope we can see that Jesus, what a great example of loving the Word of God. And even though he nailed the Old Testament, the law of Moses to the cross, Colossians 2.14, he fulfilled, he completed it. And God has left it left it here for us because it's kind of the beginning of, of a big map that goes all the way from creation, the Garden of Eden, to heaven, the tree of life. It all fits together. If we can help you in any way, whether it's to baptize you into Christ, or maybe you just need the prayers of, of the church, whatever your need might be, we urge you to come forward while we stand and while we sing.